Three decisions Manasseh made. Number one, he decided to react against his father's reformation and pull down the fences that his father had built. G.K. Chesterton said, whenever you take down any fence, always pause long enough to ask why was it put there in the first place? Why were these fences put up? Now, I want to tell you something very important in a, just a few fleeting moments here. The distinction between the Hebrew race and those around them lay in this one fundamental idea. Follow me carefully. Any worldview you can study, I challenge you to think of it. Any major religious worldview always makes one assumption that if your goodness outweighs your badness, sooner or later, that break will come for you, whether it's through karma or through righteousness or whatever it is, you will break free by volitionally pulling yourself up by your moral bootstraps. That's the assumption. Take any major worldview, that's the way it is. Except for the Judeo-Christian faith. When God rescued his people from Egypt and took them into the promised land, Righteousness and the moral law was given to them, but only as a sequence to redemption. They were redeemed first, then given the moral law, and then given the prescription for worship. You could never alter that sequence in the Hebrew mind. Redemption, righteousness, and worship. You cannot be righteous until you are first redeemed. You cannot worship until you are first redeemed and righteous. This was unique in its time. The heart was desperately in need of correction and redemption. That talks about your heart, my heart, every human heart. Dale Moody said, if you take a man who's stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track and you send him to college or educate him, at the end of it, he will steal the whole railway track. <laughs> it's the way it goes. We just get more sophisticated in our manipulations and our methods of deceit. That's exactly the way it is. India is a land of great mathematical and scientific geniuses. And yet the one thing that could totally destroy the country is its inability to cope with corruption. Virtually every man or woman who is involved in bringing about the Commonwealth Games to India, a great accomplishment, is now in prison. That's how it goes. And so when God was speaking to leaders, he taught them that the heart is in need of redemption. The leader's heart, your heart, my heart. And what happens with a man like Manasseh? He comes and takes all of these barricades away. And the next step follows logically. He, he uh, accelerated the development of heathenism. Chesterton went on to make this comment. He said, the tragedy of disbelieving in God is not that a person ends up believing in nothing. Alas, it is much worse. A person may end up believing in anything. The tragedy of disbelieving in God is not that a person may end up believing in nothing, alas, it is much worse. May end up believing in anything. Think of the things we have now actually begun to believe. Once upon a time, the shock value of those things were great. You know, I very seldom really have time to watch too much. And I'm, I'm so hesitant to even mention something like this, but... While flying in on this time, uh, I just had turned on to see if I could get some of the news or whatever, and there was some comedian that was on. I was absolutely shocked just to hear his first quip. One of the crudest of all words you could think of placed beside God. These people really care. Do these people really care? That's all it took for me, just 15 seconds, and I said, this is not even funny. But you know, when you lack the genius and the skill to make people laugh, you shock them with filth and vulgarity, and that takes the place of humor. That's what's happening. 
whether it's political leadership, whether it's the entertaining world, all of a sudden you pull down these barricades and you find you're unable to stop the tsunami of worldviews and tsunami of ideas. And that's exactly what happens here. First, he leads a reaction against his father's reformation. Next, it starts developing the acceleration of uh, heathenism and all kinds of strange beliefs. And the third thing that follows is he instituted a bitter persecution of the prophets. Sequence. Take away the true God, bring in false worship, persecute those who want to remind you of the true God. It's a logical and a chronological sequence. What happened as a result? Number one, it tells you that it is possible for one person to lead millions into untold evil. It is possible for one man, one woman, to lead millions into untold evil. It is in the 1980s, when I was relatively young and starting my own ministry, that I was uh, invited to speak at the universities in Poland. And after speaking at Warsaw that first day and heading on to Krakow and so on, my host asked me if I'd like to go and visit Auschwitz. And I told him, I said, you know, Henrik, I've, I've seen concentration camps. He said, no, which ones have you seen? I said, well, Dachau and um, Birkenau and all of that. Uh, he said, no, no, this is a death camp. Have you seen one? I said, what's the difference? He said, come and see it. So we drove and drove for about an hour and a half or two. It was a cold, foggy, gray day. And as we arrived in Auschwitz, I wasn't emotionally prepared for what I was going to see. You walk from room to room. Any one of you has been there? I'm sure many of you have. And I saw some teenagers being ushered from room to room, and some of them ultimately had to leave sobbing. I don't know what connections they bore, but they saw the, quote, the hell that had broken loose in that setting. And as I was taken from room to room, I remember in one room behind glass was 12,000 pounds of women's hair, women who'd been shaven bald before they were taken into the gas ovens and the hair woven into sacks and sold on the streets. There were tiny little suitcases and toothbrushes, children's clothing and baggy baggage there behind glass and pictures of castrated uh, twins at the hands of Joseph Mengele standing like this, looking almost like glassy-eyed and dazed. And then as you're about to enter what was the gas chamber where they were being obliterated at the rate of 12,000 every day, are the words of Adolf Hitler, I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. And then there are some historians today and some so-called watchdogs of what we tell and what we don't tell who actually want to remove the story of the Holocaust from the history books as if we don't need to be reminded of what happens when one person can lead millions into untold evil. I remember speaking at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow, talking to the general there and the stories of Joseph Stalin. I don't have time to go into that. But I remember as my wife and I were talking to him and reminding him of what Stalin had done. This general who was the chief of the historical department at this uh, Center for Geopolitical Strategy, sat across the table and the tears were running down his face. Chief of Staff looked at me as we walked out of there. He grabbed my hand, kissed the back of my wife's hand, and he said to me, Dr. Zacharias, he said, what you have told us to about God and society is true, but it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. That was his goodbye speech to us. One person can lead millions into untold evil. Secondly, and the reason one can t lead million in millions into untold evil is because most people don't know how to think anymore. The art of critical thinking is gone. The laws of logic have gone. At the University of Iowa some years ago, I was giving a talk on coherence and culture. And at the end of it, a woman ran up to the microphone, 1,500 in the audience, packed to capacity. She could hardly wait, I guess, till the turn came for question. She cupped her hand because she didn't think the microphone was good enough and just yelled at me from the back of the room, who in the world ever told you life needed to be coherent? She said, where did this come from? Is this not another Western idea you're just foisting upon that? And she went on and on. And I've learned after some time, you allow people to talk long enough, they'll end up convicting themselves. And so she was going on and on and on. And uh, finally I said, ma'am, I'll be happy to answer your question. If you could just give me one clue to help, how I can help you the best. Uh, you're asking me who told me life needed to be coherent. Is that your question? She said, yeah. I said, will you allow me to ask you a question? Is it, oh, would you want my answer to be coherent or can my answer be incoherent? 
She just stands and looked like I'd just planted a dagger in her ribs or something. And the audience burst out laughing. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I want to hear her. Is it okay for my answer to be incoherent? Or do you want my answer to be coherent? See, they live by ideas that they attack others with but they don't give that other person the privilege of questioning their assumptions. In other words, she was living a totally incoherent life. But when it was exposed in the flaws of a very reasoning that I had to be coherent in my answer, then she was living by one set of rules, but foisting a completely different set of rules on the other person. And the last thing is, first, one person can lead millions into untold evil. Secondly, because most people can't think. Number three, it's because their end result is the ultimate test of any civilization is what we do with our own children. That's the ultimate test of any civilization. What do you think of when you see these little ones sitting in front of you and singing, celebrating life? What goes through your mind and your emotions? Emotions. 